welcome everyone to Fertility Futures, which is an online forum in the feminist and queer studies of reproduction, where we discuss research in the area of fertility. And this series is created by the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, ReproSoc, at the University of Cambridge in collaboration with Reproductive Futures, which is an international conference organized by Tampere University in Finland this year. I'm Martin Smetana, a senior research associate in ReproSoc, and I'm happy to speak today to Dr. Damien Wicks, who's a professor in the College of Education, Psychology and Social Work at Flinders University in Australia. Damien is currently an Australian Research Council Future Fellow, holding fellowship that focuses on family diversity, and to date it has included studies of public attitudes to family diversity, transgender parents, fertility preservation, heterosexual first-time parents, surrogacy, foster care, and embryo donation. And as a reproductive scholar myself, I've learned a lot from Damien's research, and I've always been amazed by how much good and critical research you've been able to carry out, Damien, and how you've always been pushing the boundaries and moving on not only to new topics, but also to new approaches. So uh, I wanted to ask you for a start, how did you first get into reproduction research and how did you get interested in it? It was an interesting journey. I was doing my PhD on critical race and whiteness studies. And at this, as I started my PhD, I had my first child and I had all of my children through foster care. So I was very interested in how fostering in Australia and foster families are sort of positioned in comparison to sort of the norm of the heterosexual nuclear family who are formed through genetic relationships. So at the same time as doing my PhD, I started this sort of side focus of writing on lesbian and gay parents and foster care. And I think it sort of spiraled from there. Right. And um, I, uh, I was also going to ask you um, how, how, to what extent your, your, your early work and experience with foster care, which, which you wrote about, um, what was the way into reproductive studies uh, for you. And, and, and I'd like to take this opportunity to, to, uh, to talk a little bit about foster care. Uh, since my feeling is that it's such an underrepresented topic in reproductive studies, well, you have done major work on it. So, so why is foster care foregrounded so little and, and what opportunities can it offer? I think in a book that I wrote a couple of years ago where I looked at like 10 years worth of research I'd done and did chapters on foster care adoption, surrogacy, embryogenation, I really sort of tried to make the claim that as you say, too often we sort of either don't think about foster families or we treat foster families as wholly different to every other family. Whereas, you know, some of the work I've done has looked at foster carers who have had a child placed with them and then after a period of time, the placement ends without their intention. And time and time again, without provocation from me, those foster carers will say, this is like a pregnancy loss. And the same as foster families who are coming in to become foster families, and that's their way of conceiving of their families. We sort of tend to put it outside conversations of conception, but actually they are conceiving. They are imagining a family, they're imagining a child and bringing that into reality. So in some ways, I think there are really unique things about foster families that need to be focused on, and that's about the institutional aspects. But then there's lots of it that is so similar to other aspects of reproduction that I think we need to have those conversations. Right, and, and um, at this time when, uh, when you were starting to, to do research in, in foster care, and as you mentioned, you were always, uh, you were also becoming a parent yourself. Um, how were these two uh, intertwined? Was uh, the fact of becoming a parent yourself somehow helpful for you to do research on the topic? Uh, did it give you some kind of insider positionality or uh, vice versa? Could you talk a little bit about how you managed to, to weave this, these two together? I think it was quite unexpected in many ways that my partner at the time and I thought we wanted to do foster care, but I wasn't thinking of becoming a parent. It wasn't really on my radar. So we did it anyway because we thought it was a social good and we thought it was the right thing to do. And after maybe six months of our eldest child living with us, I sort of had this realisation that I was a parent. So in some ways I had been ill-prepared for that by the foster system. 
um, you know, that you're committing to a child for life, you're going to become a parent. But no one had really said that to me. So once that sort of entered my radar, I was then very interested in, in sort of reproductive research, whereas before that I'd had no interest in that at all. So I very much sprang from that. But then I think looking back, and that's, you know, many years ago now, I, I think I adopted quite a hard line, you know, like genetic relatedness is a problem. People use it to justify all these things and to marginalise my family. So some of those early publications, I took a very hard line. It was very critical of genetics. And then I spoke at an event one day on lesbian parenting and a lesbian mum came up to me who was an Indigenous woman and she said, you know, your critique's fair, but actually it's really culturally bound. Like genetics mean a lot for us in terms of, as Indigenous people, in terms of, you know, claiming connections to country and claiming access to rights and legal rights. And so it made me rethink that very hard line sort of stance I had. And I think, you know, if we fast forward now, however many years that is now, 15 years later, that, you know, our latest study, as you said, has been on heterosexual first time parents. So, you know, I've sort of done this whole spectrum of from very, very critical to, as you say, still my work is very critical, but, you know, wanting to look at a diversity of families. Right. So, such an interesting example. So would you say that this notion, I've, I've been looking at your um, early papers, uh, for example, the paper that you published 2006 on developmentalism and best interests yeah. of the child, right? And, and, yeah. and about the radical difference that 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 foster care can offer and that, again, yeah. lesbian parents can offer. So, so would you say that um, 15, over 15 years later, um, this changes um would would you um, argue in a different way after after all this time i think that paper which is yeah a long time ago um you know aspects of my critique of the law because it was a critique of the law um was probably a little heavy-handed in thinking about whether it was my sort of over reading of genetic essentialism in the law or whether it was what is in the law and that actual law has now changed but I do think those claims, which other people like Stephen Hicks were making, you know, still hold true. You know, if you have a, a young child, whatever their gender is, and never been abused by someone of a particular gender, then living in, a, in an old gender household that is, you know, different from that can be really healing. It can be really helpful. And so I do think some of those arguments that I made in that paper and that, again, other people at the time were making still hold true. Uh, I just think that. On the one hand, some of the stuff around genetic essentialism is true. We know in Australia and the UK and the US, lots of the legislation around reproduction, that is its focus. But there's also ways that we work around that that I think I could have taken into account more and I think I do take into account more now that genetics are not one thing. You know, if we, if we look at some of the research coming out of EU, for example, now and Jenny's work, you know, it's so and her work on epigenetics, it's really, really careful argumentation around how claims to genes work. Yeah, and, and, and so you also mentioned just a moment ago that um, there's a lot to be learned from foster care research for fertility hmm. and reproduction research at, as such. Uh, what, what are those lessons? What, what, what would you uh, point to? I mean, I think the big thing in this recent longitudinal research we've done with, with some couples, heterosexual couples who are having their first child, is time and time again, they said, well, this will be easy. We're young, we're heterosexual, we're cisgender, we'll get pregnant. You know, and most didn't have a family history of infertility. So, and we asked them purposively in their first interview before they were pregnant, what do you do if you can't get pregnant? Would you do foster care? Would you do adoption? And people sort of hedged around that question. They were either had never thought of it or they thought of it and they were unsure because they found it a bit scary that, you know, about foster care as legal rights. Um, or they were, and some people were like, yeah, sure, maybe down the track I might have children through foster care. But then lo and behold, as we kept interviewing them and some found it really hard to get pregnant and some had to use IVF, you know, those initial conversations we'd had around foster care became more salient. And I think 
where it sort of brings back to your question is foster carers negotiate or grapple with genes and the meaning of genetic relatedness all the time. And other people often don't think they'll need to grapple with that. But then you come up against infertility and you're grappling with that. Will I have to get donor genes? Will I have to foster or adopt? So all those assumptions that particularly heterosexual couples bring to reproduction often aren't borne out in the reality of their experience. Right, and it shows how, how persistent in a way this genetic thinking still is, right? yes. as you have also shown in, um, in your research. I remember this uh, paper that you wrote for the special issue that uh, Karis Thompson and I edited in, in Reproductive Biomedicine and Society Online 2018, where you also were showing how, how persistent different ways of genetic thinking are to people. Uh, even though, as you said, um, right now, th they are very nuanced and, and um, different for different groups of people, but, uh, but uh, there's some kind of um, genetic privilege, right, or um, persistence of, of, of this thinking. And of course, all those situations that you have been looking at throughout all your research are, are, um, are um, showing this. Um, one um, other important a topic I'd like to ask you about um, from your most recent work is on transgender health and reproduction, mm -hmm. um, including both transgender young people and first of all, trans fertility, and as yep. you called it, trans reproductive justice. So yep. uh, could you say a little bit uh, about how you got to articulate what trans reproductive justice is and mm. what we need to do in order to achieve it? In, I mean, in what ways did you draw on empirical research? In what ways were you in conversation with reproductive justice scholarship? It's really interesting. You know, I've been working with, as a clinician, as a therapist, with trans kids for over a decade. And at the beginning of that time, there were no conversations about fertility because we were in a legislative time in many places across the globe where trans people were still expected to accept that they had to be sterilized. And so those conversations didn't happen. And then over the last decade, those conversations have become more and more and more salient. And so I was starting to have those conversations with the kids that I work with. And then the, actually the Australian Fertility Association reached out to me and said, look, we can see this is coming down the pipeline. We need to know what we should be doing. So I'd already been doing research with trans people for maybe five years by that point. And so it wasn't something I'd had on my agenda, even though I work in reproduction. But because fertility specialists were saying, we need to know how to have these conversations. And then when we spoke to trans people, it was amazing that we put together a survey and we launched it. And, you know, it can take time to get participants. But within a fortnight, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trans people in Australia responding to the survey and just being we want to talk about this topic. So it became something that I hadn't, again, set out to really research, even though I was working in fertility and I was working with trans people. It really was sort of this bringing together of the clinical needs of trans people and, and trans people's sort of growing awareness of reproductive rights that, you know, this is not about going, well, we have to accept such and such as part of our transition. No, we have the right to preserve our fertility. So that it was again really sort of circuitous route to how that came to be that research. And, and so how do you get from there to articulating uh, trans reproductive justice that, that you have uh, wrote about in, in, in your recent writing? So that, again, you know, as we've spoken about that, all of my research takes a really critical focus. And to me, critical sort of comes from my training in critical psychology, which is about you know, being critical of ideology. It's about being critical of discourse um, and how discourse functions and rhetoric functions to marginalize or to include. And so as we started that work, it was pretty, it wasn't non-critical, but it was pretty descriptive. We really wanted to get the message out there. These are the needs that trans people have. This is what clinicians need to know. But as we then went on to do some interviews and talk to people more, we really saw some things going on uh, that trans people were experiencing and that clinicians were saying, 
and that parents of trans kids were saying as well, that we thought, hmm, this needs a critical take. And it really was around this idea of trans people who were assigned female at birth being dumped with this sort of injunction that what you should want to reproduce, you should want to have children. Part of that, I think, came from the great public awareness of trans men and reproduction. But I think it also was about you have a body that can carry a child, you should. And our participants were telling us that again and again and again. For the participants who could carry a child, their parents, their partners, their family members, their, their you know, clinicians were saying, but surely you'll want to carry a baby one day. So we were really then interested in, you know, on the one hand, we've got trans reproductive rights, but on the other hand, we've got sort of coercive reproduction or pronatalism. So we really wanted to look at what are trans reproductive rights that go beyond the sort of the sort of standard focus of reproductive justice, which is the right to raise a child healthily, the right to not have a child if you don't want to. Um, we were also sort of focused on the right to not be coerced because of how other people perceive your gender or your gender history and how that is differentially experienced by the trans people with a binary gender and, and trans people with a non-binary gender. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then uh, what I also found very interesting as part of your argument is that um, a matter of reproductive justice is ensuring that trans people can take fertility decisions and also that they have sufficient information to take informed fertility decisions. Uh, so um, why, why is it? Why, why, why do you think that information is a matter of reproductive justice? I mean, I think what I've learned over the years of working with trans young people, and one young person really stands out to me is they said, we went to speak to the fertility specialist, you know, this young person and their mum, and the facility specialist kept talking in really both gender normative ways and also ways that kept referencing their assigned sex. And so the young person said, I just switched off. And I thought, how did that person give us informed consent? There can have been no con informed consent because the young person wasn't listening. They were too triggered. And so I was really interested in how can we talk? And I think I was sort of already doing this because I'd been working with trans people for a long time, trans children, but you know, how do we have conversations with trans young people in particular, but I think the same thing goes for many adults, where informed consent is possible. And that means, you know, I always encourage people talking about gametes rather than talking about particular names for gametes. So you can give a description of what a gamete is and just use the word gamete and people will know what you mean. Um, that they can, you know, it's not confusing, even to young people. But the good thing is it's not triggering. Because, you know, we know as, as reproductive researchers, you know, egg and sperm are not gendered, but the whole world treats them as though they are. And so for some, and many, again, of the trans adults we surveyed said, I don't want anything to do with my gametes because it's too triggering of dysphoria. But we started wondering, what if the conversations were different? What if the, the way fertility specialists spoke to you were different? So that you weren't feeling triggered by dysphoria and you could think, oh, maybe I do want to do this. Maybe I could, this is worth doing. Or no, I really don't. Right, yeah. And, and uh, alongside this, of course, you have pointed to um, a few other elements um, of this um, idea of trans reproductive justice, such as, for example, uh, class issues, social class issues, because uh, as you wrote, fertility preservation is not covered by public funding. In Australia yeah. and in many places, so so it becomes pro prohibitively expensive, uh, etc. Yeah. So 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 um, this is quite a comprehensive proposal that that, that you've been uh, developing, and um, also with um, with regard to the importance of information, um, drawing on your article that you published in two thousand eighteen on fertility preservation among trans people. I found it striking that only very few of your research participants, and I noted down 7% had undertaken fertility, fertility preservation. Although on the other hand, the vast majority, 95% said that fertility, preser fertility preservation should be offered to all transgender and non-binary people. So how do you account for this difference? Is it because of uh, how information is handled and because of those conversations that you have mentioned? 
I think, I mean, it's a really consistent finding. Someone found the same thing like a decade, 15 years before us, the same sort of difference between this should be possible, but I'm not doing it. And part of it is all the things we've mentioned. It's cost can be prohibitive. It's two dysphoria triggering can be prohibitive. It's that historically some people couldn't. So, you know, in Australia, some people, it just was not possible to do it. And certainly people have told us in other studies, you know, they'll, a trans man who was having surgery and the surgeon said, well, we might as well get all that out as well. No, do you want to preserve your fertility first? Just let's remove your reproductive organs. So the, 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 this person thought, well, I guess if you're offering this and it's available to me, I'll do it. But afterwards had a lot of regret that no one had, had counseled him. No one had said, might you want to have children who are genetically related to you one day? Might you want to carry children? And that was really at a time when these public conversations about trans men and reproduction were just beginning. So in, in one hand, we can look back and go, maybe that surgeon was being thought they were being really trans affirming. I can offer you this surgery that otherwise would be quite hard to get. And lots of trans guys are wanting it and not able to get it. So here I'm offering you this. But because the conversation wasn't orienting to fertility, there was no consideration by the surgeon that actually maybe we need to start a few steps before or jumping into surgery. So it, I think a lot has shifted in that time, but I think our survey results sort of reflected that shift that people were really saying, no, this is absolutely a must. This is a right that we have. But unfortunately for many people, recognition of that right had come too late. Right, so, so, so would you place this work on trans fertility um, how would you place this work in your broader work on a critical um, developmental approach aimed at countering cisgenderism? Uh, as I understand, this is very much interlinked. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is about, you know, all of my work is sort of informed by Gabi Ansara's work on cisgenderism. And it really is about looking at how is it playing out in multiple different ways. So is it playing out? I think it is when a young person's pushed to do fertility preservation by their parents and their clinician, when they don't want to, and that happens. Is it the opposite? Is a young person's rushed into something without being able to make an informed decision about fertility preservation? I think they're all forms of cisgenderism because they're all ways of reducing trans people's lives down to one thing. Well, you want hormones, well you do, but do you wanna have this conversation first? No, oh, that's fine. You know, it's, it's about pushing trans people in very particular, what we would call transnormative sort of directions, informed by this sort of cisgenderist idea that trans people's lives are all one and the same, rather than sort of recognizing that there are many ways to be trans and that these conversations can be brought up. And I always say to young people, you know, I need to have this conversation with you. Other people who are, are talking to you will have this conversation. It can be really short if you really know where you stand, or it can be really in depth whatever works for you. It's about offering the conversation and then seeing where people will lead you rather than sort of predetermining, well, you must go down this path or this path. So here uh, I have one more question on this topic. How, how did pregnancy loss become part of this research and of those conversations? Um, I'm thinking about your recent work and papers that you published in 2020 on um, uh, experiences of pregnancy loss by men, trans masculine and non-binary people. So how, how did it come up? How, how um, did you realize that, that it was an important part of the story or an important topic to be, to be looked at? Well, again, this is that funny sort of interplay between the foster care research and other reproductive research. So, for one of my children, when he was placed with us, it was almost terminated a few months after he was placed with us. And we managed to fix that and work through it. And he's still part of our family, which is fantastic. But I was preparing myself for loss and grief. So when that didn't happen, I thought, well, this is something that needs to be researched, foster carers and loss and grief over placement terminations. So that happened, you know, back in whenever that was, 2013. And then, my colleague Clemmy Jew and I got interested in research on cisgender heterosexual people, men and women, and pregnancy loss. 
Uh, and I think I probably wouldn't have had that same interest if I hadn't already done that work on foster carers and placement termination when so many said it's like a pregnancy loss. And so when it came to this trans pregnancy study, um, we didn't purposefully ask our participants about pregnancy loss. It was sort of a sub probe of our questions about how did you get pregnant. Um, when it came to looking at the data, our project lead Sally Hines is very generous and she was sort of open to us looking at whatever we wanted to look at. So I was sort of thought, well, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from conception. And for some people, conception is um, follows through to a pregnancy loss. So it sort of surprised me and it didn't surprise me that there was really nothing in the literature on transmasculine non-binary people and pregnancy loss. And there was a few little bits and pieces, as you'll know from our paper. Um, but, you know, at the same time that we were writing it, there was a, a story in the New England Medical Journal of a trans man who presented to emergency and had stomach pains and everyone sort of ignored him and said, wait, wait, wait. And he miscarried. Whereas if the, if the ER staff had sort of gone, oh, this could be a pregnancy, this man could be pregnant, maybe he wouldn't have lost his baby. So it was such a timely moment that we came to write that paper. And I think it was such an interesting paper to write because we find time and time again, I, or I find in this project, the trans pregnancy project, that reviewers, journal reviewers say, yes, but this sounds like what cisgender lesbian women say. This sounds like what cisgender heterosexual women say. And we have to keep making the case that, well, it might sound like that, but you and I can both look at a cloud and see two different things. We're looking at the same cloud, but our, our, our perception of it is fundamentally different. The same thing goes for conception, for pregnancy loss, for reproduction, for trans people as compared to cisgender people. If you don't take into account cisgenderism, it could look vaguely similar. But if you actually listen to people's stories, it's not similar. So that has been a really interesting part of the journey of that project, I think, is really having to make that case. You know, at one point, anyone publishing anything on trans people and reproduction were making a case that everyone unilaterally accepted was unique. And now it seems the opposite is almost in play, that people are going, yes, but how is this unique? Why do we need this, this, this paper on trans people and, and reproduction? So it's an interesting case to be having to make, I think, at this time. Right. And uh, can I also ask you a kind of a methodological question at this point? Uh, because you've done uh, part of this research and a lot of the research that you've been talking about, uh, in amazing collaborations with people in different parts of the world, uh, how come? Is it something <laughs> um, um, something uh, related to the discipline uh, where you um, where you come from? Although your approach to psychology is very critical and and um, and maybe not necessarily only conventional, uh, is, or is it is it just the nature of, of of the research? How how have you been able to? to construct those um, amazing collaborative projects? I mean, I think you know that people working in the reproductive space who are kindred spirits, who are critical thinkers, um, are less common than are people who are not. So, you know, I think without any sort of um, minimizing of them, amazing work that ReproSuck does. I think the work that ReproSuck does is in the minority, in the huge field of reproduction. You know, that really critical, really thoughtful, really philosophical work. And so when you find people that are, you know, like minds, and, and the same goes to you and I, even though we haven't collaborated yet, you know, it, it just feels natural. It feels really, this will be easy. Even if we might have different personalities and different approaches to method and to, to projects, you just know that you're in the same headspace. And I think that's what's so appealing is that, you know, all of us on the Trans Pregnancy Project come from vastly different sort of epistemological backgrounds and personal backgrounds. But what unites us is that sort of critical passion for looking at trans reproduction. And I think, I think for every sort of big sort of project I've been involved in, particularly international ones, that's always what makes it happen is that shared passion for critical thinking. Um, that you often don't find in other spaces of reproductive research. 
Right. Thank you. This this helps me understand. And there's also the reason why we're speaking today and why 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 I reached out to you at some point to um, to invite you to the special issue. Um, and, and I can imagine uh, the um, um, the conversations that that um, are understandable from your writing, the conversations with, with your co-authors that you're talking about. Um, let's talk for a while about kinship, um, mm -hmm. about your 2016 book on critical kinship studies, um, and about the concept that you proposed of Western human kinship practices. Um, so um, you argued that our common understandings of what it means to be in relationships with others often limit our potential um, because the narratives of Western human kinship silence many exclusions it is reliant upon. And so how can we challenge such dominant understandings of kinship and, and how may your concept of Western human kinship be, be helpful in, in this respect? Well, there's lots of things to say about this. Um, I would, again, I would want to like start before I sort of answer the question of looking at those, how you come to do something. So Liz and I, Liz was over here in Australia visiting and we were going to do this book. And so we put in a pr proposal, it got accepted. And then I became really good colleagues with two people who are now very dear friends. Nick Taylor and Heather Fraser, who really introduced me to the field of critical animal studies. So if you saw our book proposal and that book, they are nothing alike. It was this real journey of going, well, sure, like Sarah and Marsha and everyone has already said all these things about critical kinship studies. We don't really need to say those things again. And then at the same time as I think we had our proposal accepted, um people in oh no i can't remember his name but he's in denmark who had the wonderful editor collection come out on critical kinship studies so again we sort of it was this moment of well we could continue on the path we were on and say something that probably everyone else has already said or we could think a bit differently and so to me it was really these conversations with nick and heather and then with liz around what is the issue here with Western kinship studies, well, it's anthropocentric. That's what we felt people weren't saying a lot, that, that kinship studies or reproductive studies weren't talking to critical animal studies. And so that book for us really became this way to speak to that, that lack of conversation, that you know we can make all these claims about human kinship, but we don't call it human kinship, we just call it kinship. And we ignore that kinship looks similar for maybe some primates and vastly different for other animals. And so how do we have a conversation around kinship that starts from the place that, well, if we're looking at human kinship, how does human kinship differentiate itself? How does it claim itself as kinship proper, if you like? And then the second thing I would say about your question is that I think we, we, our, we were out of time in a sense. Um, I think we wrote that book at a time or maybe in a way that that message that I just said, hopefully quite clearly, hasn't been taken up in the ways we had hoped it would. You know, you don't write a book to make money. Certainly you don't as an academic. Um, and you know that your reach is probably gonna be fairly limited because academic books are expensive. But you hope people will at least engage with the ideas, even if they don't like them great you disagree with us that's absolutely fine but it's been odd how it's been engaged with it's been odd that people have either ignored it or not it's not been on their radar or they've sort of just taken it as a generic reference for kinship studies you know if someone's writing a sentence in a paper and they need to slot in a reference about kinship they just slot in a reference to the book i haven't seen anyone really engaging with it around the animal work which we bring in in every single chapter and so it's really interesting, again, that our whole aim was to write a critique of human kinship studies, and its uptake has only been about human kinship studies. So it didn't do what we wanted to do, was to bring that conversation in around human kinship studies and critical animal studies. 
And I still don't quite know why that is. Maybe it was the wrong time. Well, and it has also led to, uh, to your mm. further research and especially yes. to, your, to your latest work, right? Um, yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the links between, between your previous research, both on kinship and fertility and reproduction and your uh, latest work and, and latest book um, on um, animals. And you're right, thank you for that reminder. Like, you know, writing with Liz is always a joy, but I think the extra joy of doing that book was that it brought me into greater conversation with critical animal studies myself. So it opened up a whole new sort of avenue of research that I had, again, lived with animals for 15 years or longer, but hadn't thought about doing that research. So, you know, we started doing research. It was probably very sort of standard psychology research, you know, surveys, looking at the intersections of animal abuse and domestic violence for LGBTIQ plus people. Beyond the work that Liz and I did in critical kinship studies, I wasn't thinking more about the animal aspect. Part of that was because it's fraught. You know, humans speak for animals all the time. So speaking about animal reproduction, which is sort of owned by veterinary science, seemed really complicated but then as i got to work with nick and heather more i came to see that it it's fraught but it needs to be spoken about and there's some wonderful papers around why we sterilize animals and particularly domesticated animals and how who that's for you know the the, the claim is always it's for the animal but who is it really for i mean what's the whole history of domestication about so, you know, and when you link that into the forced sterilization of people across the globe, across history, you know, it's that same conversation around population management, about desirable populations, about desirable reproducing bodies. Um, so when we see it in terms of animal breeding, well, there's very desirable breeding, but then we see it in regards to animals who are not seen as desirable, it's undesirable breeding, we sterilize. So, and it's also about behavior management. It's about all these gendered readings of animals that we import from humans. And so the more I came to do that work, the more I came to realize that it was just a really natural extension of my work on human reproduction. It wasn't this different sphere. Like I'm not, I'm not a vet, so I'm not trying to do veterinary science reproductive work. I'm trying to look critically at how we think about animal reproduction and how it links to how we think about human reproduction. Fascinating and so so timely and important. Thank you for this work. Uh, when, 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 when is it going to be out? Well, that's, you know, that's early days. We've, you know, we've done the book for Cambridge on called Queering, Queer Entanglements, which sort of looks at LGBTIQA plus people and animal companions. And there's a bit of pieces in there around reproduction, only small bits, but I think it's some work that we're just starting to, Liz and Nick and I have been working on around multi-species research and looking at how our relationships with animals who we've lost. So again, this sort of narrative of loss and grief that's been quite consistent in my research, how that fits in with desirable animals, how that fits in with the animals we've lived with and their reproductive um rights and how their reproductive rights are taken away from them um and you know for those of us in nick and i in particular who who have um cared for animals who were rehomed from shelters uh, how those decisions are made about animals and desirability are, is really important so i think it's it's something that is sort of watch this space like i think it's something that i want to work towards doing more on and again i think it's a bit like the critical kinship work, it's going to be a tricky space to be in because I think we're not veterinary scientists and that's where most of this work is done. Um, and so that, that critical work on animals and reproduction is, you know, we've got Sarah's amazing book on the topic, we've got other people's, you know, amazing, Sarah's is probably some of the main work actually, someone asked me recently, where do I go to look at, you know, animals and reproduction? I said, well, Sarah's Dolly book, you know, like, that's where a lot of this started. But again, I think Sarah's book is another example of being in a very mo particular moment in time where if you look at the citations of that book, they're not by people doing critical animal studies in the large part. They're people doing human reproduction studies. 
So again, Sarah was making a very particular claim that I think in some times gets lost. So when I said it to this person, well, the first person you should, should look at in Sarah's book, they were like, oh, of course. They hadn't sprung to their mind because they'd put that in the human reproduction basket. So I think it is about, you know, how do we carve out these spaces where these conversations can happen? And probably this carving out of, of, of those spaces is linked to, to the importance of the term critical in all your work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, here, um, let me just return for a moment to, um, to the term critical um, yeah. and uh, to your book on critical approach to surrogacy. Um, specifically, in what ways would you recommend being critical in our approach to surrogacy? So again, returning to, um, in this specific case, returning to human kinship and human reproduction and fertility, uh, which of course, as you said, um, relies upon uh, all the multi-species um, networks uh, and exclusions. Uh, but if we uh, zoom in onto surrogacy for a moment, which has been also uh, one of important topics in your research, um, how, how shall we apply this uh, critical stance? I mean, it's, uh, it's always hard for me to ask, answer a question without telling a story. Um, you know, I think, again, the research we did on surrogacy was at such a specific moment in time where we sort of got lost in the shuffle. We started doing that research and then all the amazing work from people like Amrita Pandey came out and Kalin Devora's work came out. And so we'd published a few papers and then we sort of thought, I think we need to stop talking. Like... Uh, the research we'd done was already dated. We had done research on transnational commercial surrogacy in India, and then India closed that. So it sort of felt like it had become a bit redundant. And then there was other people like Amrita Pandey who were in there, still on the ground doing the research that we no longer had access to. And so we thought, this is not our space to speak in. And But we both love writing books, Comey and I, and we wanted to write something, and we were sort of deliberating what would be the point of a book? What would, could we contribute to the conversation? And I think in some ways we were really led by the work of Kalindi Vora, which was really, in my mind, was making this argument that what is a critical approach is, we either had people saying, surrogacy is a feminist issue because women should have the right to choose about their bodies, which is true. And if that includes choosing surrogacy, that's true. Or we had people saying fundamentally, surrogacy is the commodification of women's bodies. So there were these two opposing sort of positions and Kalindi's work to me in particular really tried to speak across those positions. And so that's how we sort of came to see a space for a book was how do we speak across those positions? How do we look at, you know, women who undertake surrogacy arrangements, intending parents, children conceived of surrogacy arrangements, politicians, general public, like how do we speak to all those different stakeholders in one book, which seemed impossible. And then we thought, well, if we take this critical approach that is it inherently bad or good, that's not our question. Our question is, how does it function? That's what the critical really meant in that book was, how does surrogacy function as a discourse around reproduction, around women's bodies, and around people's desire for a child they're genetically related to. So that's how we sort of worked. And again, it was using a lot of Sarah Ahmed's work around queer phenomenology and what does it mean to think about embodiment through this sort of critical lens. Right, and, and you also um, uh, suggested this approach of disorientation as a critical tool yes. for understanding surrogacy. Uh, which obviously is in conversation with Sarah Ahmed's work as well. Yeah. Um, so so what does disorientation mean in, in this context? Or how is it related to what you call different orientations, right? Because you, you took the orientations, the perspectives of different parties in this surrogacy yes. process. Um, and, um, and then uh, you, you came to this uh, proposal of, of disorientation. What, what, what would it be? I think it... To me, it was a bit, it reminds me of, my own work reminds me of 
um, were by Fiona Nicol, who's a white academic in Australia, though she's currently in Canada. Um, and she wrote this wonderful paper years ago about what it meant for her as a white woman working with Indigenous people and in Indigenous spaces. And she wrote this wonderful piece called Falling from Perspective. And she, she sort of made this claim that white people often talk about Indigenous perspectives. And the same thing I think often happens with trans perspectives, but white people or cisgender people are sort of functioning in this space of the objective of the you know, outside of perspective and can look over everything. And Fiona was arguing that white people need to fall from perspective and sort of land in this reality of indigenous sovereignty. And I think the same thing was really true in that work we were doing on surrogacy was we needed to fall from this sort of bird's eye view where we could say as two people who had not done surrogacy ourselves, and we own that in the book, to sort of fall from that sort of space, this outsider space into the space of surrogacy and let that disorient us, but also look at how our participants were disoriented, how other people orient themselves to the topic of surrogacy. So again, that was our way of sort of applying a critical approach because we weren't insiders to the topic of surrogacy. We weren't doing the ethnographies that Andrew Panda, for example, was doing. We weren't there on the ground doing that. So to make a meaningful contribution, we had to sort of fall from, which I think in some ways our previous sort of journal articles on, the, on our research had done, was adopt this very outsider, critical perspective, that got us a lot of flack. A lot of particularly gay men were very unhappy with our account of gay men and, and commercial surrogacy. So as you probably know very well. And so we, we needed to find a way to fall from that outside of perspective into a space where we were part of the story. And I think, I don't know if we, it's in a, you can comment on whether you think we did that, but I think it was about, it wasn't just saying, we're two people who haven't used surrogacy. It was more than that. It was about how do we sit, situate these debates as part of a terrain that we're all a part of rather than just people who do surrogacy. Right, and, and um, well, in my, my, my opinion, you, you, you have um, definitely achieved that through, through this perspective of different orientations uh, of different parties of the surrogacy process. And, um, and through um, your focus as well on the role and rights of all the people included in the process. I can remember also an early an earlier paper that you wrote with Deb Dempsey about precisely where, where, where you started yes. theorizing on this, um, uh, on the importance of, um, of looking at all the uh, participants um, and their rights at the same time. So, which obviously then um, was developed uh, in depth in, in your book. Um, yeah. Let me just ask maybe one uh, almost final question as we're almost running out of time um, um, about race um, that you have mm. mentioned just, um, just a moment ago and that has also been an important um, part of your research uh, from the very beginning actually, um, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, so, um, how, um, through your research, would you say race and fertility are linked? Because in many of the uh, studies, um, especially in psychology, um, race is not a very um, relevant perspective. Uh, and you have been continuously drawing attention to it, and even in some cases you have um, you have made it explicit, such as in, in, in some part of your surrogacy research. Um, so how would you say um, is, is it uh, relevant in, uh, in your fertility research? I mean, I think that race is hyper salient in reproductive research across the board when the bodies being spoken about are not white. The problem for me, I think, the problem for all of us is when it's white bodies that are being spoken about, race becomes invisible, which is sort of how whiteness operates. And again, a story, you know, when I was doing my PhD on race and whiteness in Australia, and I started doing this research on reproduction and foster care, 
and I thought, well, I want to write a, write a paper on white lesbians and gay men and reproduction in Australia at the time, which was very fraught and very contested at the time. Lesbian women still didn't have access to donor sperm, for example, um, so, and gay men didn't have access to surrogacy, so it was a very fraught time politically. And I wrote a paper about white gay activism in Australia around parenting and its whiteness. And journal after journal said, no, we don't want that. We don't want to hear that. We don't, we're not having those conversations. That is not where things are at. And eventually got published in a really little journal. And I think it's sort of disappeared since. Um, but it, it gave me two messages. One, well, the clear message was don't talk about this. Um, this, is, this is far too complex and fraught. And the other message to me was, well, you need to keep talking about it. So, you know, I had a little breather talking about a few other bits and pieces of things and then came back to it, as you said, through the surrogacy research. And our first paper that Clemmie and I wrote was around gay men and surrogacy and race privilege. And we had email after email from white gay men saying, you can't say this. Our rights are fraught, which they were, sure. Um, but our point was, yes, so are women in India whose bodies you are using to do surrogacy. And so it really brought that conversation back full circle to a space where I thought, no, I'm, I can't be, not that I ever was, but I can't allow myself to be talked out of these conversations because they need to happen. And I think, you know, the research, you know, even in the animal book that we've just published, you know, the same thing that, that we got a sort of subtle hint from some of our reviewers that, you know, maybe some of this was a bridge too far, but then other reviewers were like, you need to talk about race and whiteness more. So we did. Uh, and the more we looked at it, the more we could see stuff around whiteness happening in LGBTIQA plus communities around animals. And so it was really important for us to bring that focus in. But I think, you know, it's a difficult line when certain sort of, you know, organisations that are sort of campaigning for political rights, as we all should be, sort of don't want to talk about their whiteness. They want to say, let's focus on gender or sexuality. We shouldn't be talking about whiteness because that causes problems. But, you know, there's amazing work being done now on the histories of trans people's lives and how eugenics, for example, so AJ Lowick's work out of Canada, you know, is part of that history of trans people and sterilization and affirming care. It's both part of both stories. And so we can't not talk about race when we talk about, in particular, white people in the field of reproduction. It's so vital. And so we've got a, a chapter coming out very soon, I think, in a book edited by the crew from Sweden, Rikke Andresen. Uh, it's a handbook on critical race and whiteness studies. And we have got a chapter in it on our trans pregnancy project, looking at the whiteness of the project, the whiteness of us as researchers, and the whiteness of what some of our white participants said in, in regards to their positioning as trans masculine people reproducing. So it was a really important chapter. It was a difficult chapter for us to write as a team, but it was so important because otherwise we're sort of part of the problem, you know, of sort of going, well, we tried to get people who weren't white and some of our participants weren't white, but that's the end of the story. Um, no, we needed to talk about whiteness really specifically and really purposively. It's amazing um, how you are showing the, the, the connections between uh, all the different groups, both human and non-human, uh, that, um, that sometimes I are, are analyzed, looked at separately, um, or thought about separately, uh, but then there are obvious connections between, um, well, sterilization of um, uh, different groups of people in different places and, um, and how uh, fertility uh, works um, across those, those different groups. So thanks for um, showing all these connections. One more connection that I've been thinking about uh, is to masculinity, because this has been also quite a topic in your, uh, in your research. Uh, and um, especially in your most recent research, um, you've been looking at the links between fertility and masculinity, um, uh, which, which are quite um, um, diverse. 
um, because you are showing that on one hand, uh, there are very traditional notions of masculinity, but then there are also um, some um, new and um, nurturing forms um, that, that people uh, are um, integrating. Um, so um, can you see any changes in, um, in those links between fertility and masculinity over time in your research? I mean, I think something I would say is, you know, in psychology, when you train in psychology, you are taught to have a very singular focus. If your focus is on locus of control, all of your research should be on that. If your research is on self-esteem, all of your research should be on that. And I, that was never appealing to me to spend the next 40 years of my life in a career where I research one topic. I can see how it works for people. They build a career, they get funding. It, it's a successful model of doing research. But for me, I think if I hadn't done all these different things, I wouldn't be able to tell the story that we've told today, you and I together. I think it needs all the bits of the story. And I think masculinity is part of that story. I think doing masculinity research was never of interest to me. I think I have a fraught relationship to masculinity and I didn't really want to look at it anymore. But then, you know, some students were interested in looking at it and, and a PhD student I had, I did it for her PhD, I looked at men and primary caregiving. And it really, what it reminded me of was that a lot of my work, which we haven't talked about, but, you know, adopts an intersectional focus following the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and other black feminists. But I think what I've learned over the years, even in a book, you cannot address every single facet of a person's life. You have to come at things from lots of different angles in lots of different ways. A piece for the conversation, a podcast with you, you know, a book, some journal articles. You have to do all of these different things, looking at all these different topics to try and get at the sort of issue that you want to get at. You can't just write a book on masculinity or men and fathering and look at race and class and ability and think you could have done it all justice because you would have left out animals or you would have left out religion. There'd be something that didn't appear in your picture. So I think you have to come at things, and masculinity is a good example, from so many different angles to try and get a story. And that means people, you know, like you were probably in the minority who very kindly read lots of different things I've written and you see all the threads. Um, that book that I wrote a couple of years ago, Diverse Pathways to Parenthood, was an attempt at trying to bring some of these threads together. But even that, there's so many things that didn't appear in that book. So I think it's, it's what makes research exciting and why there's always something more to do because there's always more threads to pull in. I hope that some of these threads, threads have been visible today as we're going through different, um, different topics that you've dealt, dealt with. Uh, is there anything that we should add or any important um, topic or theme um, that, that we haven't talked about yet today? No, just now you've of course made me, I've got to put it on my list to do this more of this research on animals and reproduction from a critical approach. Like it, it was on my like back burner list, but maybe I need to bump it up the list a bit because you've really helped me see some of the threads that I've forgotten in my own research. So it's lovely to sort of connect those threads and see what I need to do more work on. Well, uh, it's amazing to go, how much. It's, it's, I was going to say to go back and read Sarah's book again. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's amazing how how much research you have done. And as I said at the beginning, uh, it's, it's always been one one of the things that that, um, that I've been imp impressed by uh, how much different kinds of research you have done um, over uh, over the years. Um, and so um, I had this final question uh, about your uh, research and writing praxis and and, and workshop, how come that, that, you are, that you've been able to do all those different projects at a time, which is quite a, quite a job, right? frankly. I mean, that's a whole other podcast episode, but, but I think I was just thinking like something my mum used to always say when I, when I was little and I could first start to talk, the main thing I ever said was, what's that, what's that, what's that? And that sort of is me, like I, I want to know, it's not, because I want to get promoted. It's not because I want to be important or people to recognize me. It's that I want to know the answers. 
so many, you know, I watch television or I watch a movie or I talk to friends, I talk to you today and I think, I need to know the answer to that. And if I can go and Google Scholar it and find the answer, perfect, I'll step away. But if I can't find someone else has answered that question, I want to know the answer to the question. And so that's how I'm sort of compelled in a way. I think it's inherent to my being to, to always want to look and sort of understand. It's not to own, like I really can't stand papers who say, you know, this is the first paper on this, like, I don't, it's a very colonizing way of thinking about things. It's not that I want to be the first or be the most known for saying something. It's that I just want to understand it. And I think my writing is always a process of understanding. You know, I know that something I wrote a decade ago, my view would have shifted because I, I developed my knowledge through that. There's no end point to that, that desire to know. So it's always... I'm sort of compelled by that desire to know, but I think I've also been very fortunate that I've had eight years, as we spoke about earlier, um, on this fellowship that I'm just wrapping up now to write. So one would hope in eight years, if your job is to write, you learn how to write efficiently. And I think I do. So part of it is that, and part of it is that my writing really is driven by that desire to know. So I do all the preparation work for writing and my literature review and all that stuff, but then I write because I'm learning as I write. I'm thinking and theorizing and processing as I write. So to me, writing is exciting. It's, it's not a chore because I'm always trying to get to that point where I think, oh, I understand this thing I've been trying to understand in this moment. And my understanding will continue to grow. But in this moment, I've, I've got some answer to that question I had. Yeah, thank you very much for for this inspiring perspective and for reminding this, which is as as we know sometimes it's uh, it's easy to to uh, forget about those motivations among the academic requirements and um, and about the the academic among the academic maze which we're a part of and and these are the most important motivations. So probably that that's part of the secret, definitely. And in terms of methodologies. Because you, you've also followed different methodologies, um, such as using existing data, doing your own interviews, analysis of cultural objects, and just TV shows. Um, so, so uh, what have you learned about research methods, or what's what what's your favorite research method? What's been most helpful to you? Um, or, or, in other words, what kind of research methods would you say are most adequate to come to capture contemporary fertility changes? I think it's in a sort of rather sort of mercenary fashion. It's sort of, it's what gets you through the door, what gets you on the path to answering the question. So when Clemmie and I were talking a lot about gay men and surrogacy, we didn't have a, an avenue through which we could do that research using primary data. So at the time when it was becoming very topical, there were TV shows airing and they were sort of, you know, high profile, quite serious, um, you know, commentators. And so we thought, well, let's write a media piece on how gay men are talking about themselves on television around surrogacy. And that then led us very circuitously to having them developing the networks to do the primary research and talk with gay men about surrogacy. So to me, it's sort of being Opportunistic sounds like a bad word, but it's more about if there's an area that you think this needs to be spoken about and I need to learn about this, I, I'm hoping that I can contribute to other people's lives and understandings by answering a question, then I think you use the most, maybe expedience, a better way to say it, the most expedient way to answer that question. So that, that is if you use existing data to get you, get the ball rolling, get the conversation happening, that's what you do. And then if you're able to do some interviews or you do some surveys or do some ethnography, you do that. If you have the community connections to go straight into doing the interviewing and ethnographies, then of course you'll do that. I think it's really about if you have that passion to answer questions and sort of enrich people's lives through the answers to those questions, you use the avenues you've got to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for all these um, tips, uh, for all um, for all your research, uh, for the conversation. Um, I think we can uh, we can leave it here, even though we could probably continue chatting for <laughs> for quite a while. Yeah. 
given the wealth of research that you've done. Um, it's been very interesting uh, to, um, to talk today and I'm sure that, that um, this will be also a very interesting um, conversation for, for um, those who are listening to us uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you.